Well, hello and welcome to TechNow, the web series for ServiceNow admins, builders, and developers on a variety of platform topics. My name is Chuck Tomasi from ServiceNow, Senior Developer Advocate. I've got to update that slide. I just realized my title was wrong. Note to self. <laughs> I've been with ServiceNow for about uh, two, 10 and a half years. I, I don't know what year it is anymore. It's been like 10 years in the last 12 months. It's crazy. But uh, no, really, I started in 2010, was a customer for a couple before that, and always focused on custom applications, integrations, and the platform in general. have a couple of hobbies outside of what I do for work, but uh, many of them are closely related to work, so we won't get into that. Instead, I'm going to turn it over to Craig Stepp for his introduction. And I'm Craig Stepp. I'm a program manager for Cloud Labs. I just noticed that my title's wrong. It's, I'm actually a uh, lead staff develop, uh, programmer. <laughs> um, I specialize in cloud automation, and I produce all the uh, back-end uh, infrastructure that we use for our classes when we when we uh, do training uh, through ServiceNow, whether it's at the Knowledge Conference or any of the training that we offer uh, through ServiceNow. And sometimes uh, partners and all that kind of stuff we help out with their infrastructure. I've been with ServiceNow for almost seven years, so coming up on uh, seven years, that's, that's actually... Uh, a long time since like, seems like it was just yesterday and i will turn it over now to jeremy hey folks my name is jeremy duncan platform architect uh, on our workflow design studio team used to be known as our solution innovation team but we recently rebranded i started as a customer on the service now platform about nine years ago so pre-aspen um, i have 16 years of enterprise uh, service management experience most of that being in it and it secure or information security excuse me um, started uh, my knowledge experience back in 2013 got to speak about a product called technopedia by bdna uh, was a, a fun experience and have enjoyed the knowledge conferences ever since. Can't wait to get back in, into the live uh, conferences and be with you folks. Uh, just a little bit of personal uh, fun fact about me. Um, I was a reserve police officer for seven years recently, uh, retired uh, for medical reasons, but enjoyed that a uh, way to give back to my community. Um, so wonderful uh, pleasure to be here. And I will uh, move it on to our wonderful speaker, Mr. Garon. Hi there, my name is Yaro Gez. I'm a manager in platform and engineering. My title is correct. Um, I've been at ServiceNow for exactly three years. I hit my three-year date just a couple of days ago, which is exciting. Um, prior to being a manager, I was a staff software engineer on the agent workspace team, um, helping to build out that product. And prior to ServiceNow, I had co-founded a data security startup, and I worked in M health and financial industries as well. When I'm not coding, I'm playing piano, singing, working in the garden, hiking, camping, cooking, and playing with my uh, one-year-old son. Happy to be here. Today's agenda, <laughs> uh, we're going to review the, the process automation and designer play playbook, continuing on from the last episode. And we're going to talk about the playbook uh, configuration and options, and of course, a demonstration and do a little Q&A afterwards. So just to tell you that uh, when his audio is doing a little better, Chuck participates in Breakpoint. It's his own podcast from ServiceNow. It's a developer podcast where he interviews uh, ServiceNow developers and people around ServiceNow uh, for the podcast. And you can go subscribe to that. There's a link down below. And just search for Breakpoint, and you should be able to find it in pretty much all of the podcast um, directories all over the Internet. So I want, also want to tell you, if you're interested in participating in doing that little bit of development, uh, like a, a lot of others um, around ServiceNow, you can go to the developer.servicenow.com and you get a free uh, personal developer instance. There's all kinds of documentation, uh, lots of developer resources there for you to actually get involved and start building out applications on your own or just seeing what ServiceNow can do for you. So go over there and check that out at the developer.servicenow.com. And now we will start off with the process automation designer, and I'll turn it over to Yaron. Thank you very much. So this is part two of a two-part series on process automation designer and playbook, two new products that shipped in Paris. Uh, first, we have some legalese, uh, safe harbor statements, uh, everything you see here for future releases shouldn't uh, influence buying decisions. 
Behind every great experience is a great workflow. That is the philosophy that really drives these two products, process automation designer and playbook experience. Um, as we broke down last time, they are two different products. Process Automation Designer is a no-code designer for authoring cross-enterprise workflows in a single unified process. Fancy way of saying it's a process builder. Um, on the other hand, Playbook Experience is a UI platform for viewing and interacting with business process workflows in real time. Uh, both can exist independently of the other, but they work extremely well when coupled together. Uh, now, what problem are we trying to solve with Playbook? Um, we're really trying to get at the fact that fulfillers who are working on tasks or processes don't have a simple, simplified, task-oriented view of a multi-step process. Um, there's a lack of visibility. You have to click in and out of a lot of related lists to do your work. It's hard to see where you are in the multi-step process and what's the current state. And it's hard to know what to do next. You have to scan through forms, fields, notes, um, in order to figure out what exactly is on you. So the vision for solving this is Playbook. Uh, it's in order to provide a way to visualize and interact with business process workflows in real time via a simple task-oriented view in order to ensure a consistent response to commonly encountered situations. And those words are bolded for a reason. Uh, this is bi-directional for visualizing it a process as it is moving, but you can also interact with that process. It can go in both directions and all of this is happening in real time. As the process updates, the UI updates, and as a fulfiller or any other user interacts with the playbook, it updates the process in real time. Now the anatomy of a playbook, um, everything starts with a parent record. Um, you may recall from last time's session that processes have triggers that are defined based off of when a record is created or a record is updated. Um, that is often referred to as the input record, but in our sense, we refer to it as the parent record. In this case, the parent record is open within Agent Workspace. Uh, and you can see here that within Agent Workspace, we have a playbook embedded within a related item panel. So for those familiar with work workspace, you can add related items to any form that show up as these tabs here. And what we recommend and what we, we ship for out-of-the-box playbooks is to add a playbook as a related item panel to your form. So we can see the playbook rendered here as such. The playbook in itself is broken down. The lanes from the process automation designer are rendered as stages here as an accordion that can be extended. Uh, by default, we expand any lanes that are in progress. And the activities within that lane are rendered as cards. Um, and those are also expanded by default if that activity is in progress. How we actually go about rendering that activity depends on its experience type and its experience properties, which we'll describe shortly. I'd like to take a step back for a bit and just reiterate what are the roles involved in all of this? Who are the different user personas? Because there are several. On the far left-hand side, we start with a developer. Uh, the developer is the one who's working in Flow Designer to uh, working with flows, actions, activity definitions in order to automate individual pieces of the business process. Um, they are building the building blocks that the process owner will use and encapsulating complicated logic into reusable pieces. Next, you have the process owner. The process owner is the one who is going to work in Process Automation Designer to build processes in order to organize the pieces of the business process into a cross-enterprise workflow. So they're going to take the building blocks that the developer has provided and wire them up together. Next, you have the workspace administrator. They are the one who is going to be configuring playbook experience, defining what that user experience should be in order to configure the appropriate views of the business process for the right users. They're the ones who will be embedding the playbook into the workspace and configuring how it can show up. It's highly configurable, as we'll show. Finally, you have the agent. The agent is the one who is working in agent workspace uh, on the playbook and actually doing the work completing individual tasks within the business process. So how do we render these activities? Now, activities are powered by flows. And flows can be thought of as a black box. They can do anything and everything. And it's hard to know exactly what it is that they're doing from the outside. So what we do is we categorize these activities using activity uh, experience types. 
an experience type will loosely define what we can expect from a user uh, as a way to experience what this activity is. And the experience type will define a collection of experience properties that can be mapped to uh, work being done by the flow. And then we will render that to the user in a meaningful way. Our default render is what you can see here. It will interpret those experience properties and provide support for forms, attachments, checklists, SLA countdown timers, rich text, deep linking, dot walked field references, as well as clickable actions, buttons, and dropdowns. And uh, a really rich experience is a way to interpret what those different properties are. On the right-hand side, all the text that you see in red, these are our sample experience properties that are associated with the experience type called record. Uh, most, the majority of times, the experience type will be a record because this is service now and everything is really record driven. Um, and you'll see that it exposes a property called icon, which will control the icon in the top left, a tagline, title, description, um, these label value pair fields, we refer to them as record fields. It's a comma separate list of fields uh, on a given record will render as such. If any of those fields are references themselves, it will be clickable um, to open up that record, reference record in a new tab. Uh, if you tell us to show a checklist and the associated record with this activity contains a checklist, we will show it forms, attachments, the buttons that I mentioned before, and a dynamic footer, all of which will also make a lot more sense once we get to the demo, which is why I'm talking so fast so I have enough time for it. Now, we also support custom experience types and custom renderers. So if you don't like the experience types that we ship with, you can define your own, and you can define any collection of experience properties that make sense for you. So you can choose what of those experience properties you want to expose. We also have a framework for building custom renderers. Um, in the Paris release, uh, this is pretty much targeted for our own uh, business units and app teams, such as CSM and ITSM, to create custom renders. Uh, it's a little bit more trickier to do it as a third-party customer or partner. However, uh, in uh, Rome and beyond, we are planning on adding this ability to build these custom renders in UI Builder. So some of the custom renders that we ship with you can see here a list render if you want to render an activity not as a record of the form but instead as a list of records um, or as a knowledge article and show a little preview of the knowledge or record or as a create record if you want to embed a new record form as opposed to an update record form each of these experience types that correspond to these custom renders will expose different properties for example a list experience type will expose, well, what table is this list? What's the query? What's the conditions? Uh, and so on and so forth. Now, the way that you interact with a process that's moving in real time is through declarative actions. Um, these allow agents to interact with these business workflows. They can run server scripts against associated records. They can dispatch client actions within workspace, for example, to open an associated record in a new tab. They can display custom modals, for example, to show an activity stream in a modal. They support rich conditional logic, server conditions, client conditions, user role, CRUD access. Anyone who's familiar with declarative actions from Workspace, they power the buttons that you see in the top of lists, related lists, field decorators. They're heavily used already in Workspace, and we use them in Playbook as well. The way that we integrate this with Process Automation Designer is those experience properties I de uh, described before. When you edit an activity definition, you can provide hard-coded values for those experience properties. For example, you can fill in a title that you want to show in this card. But more powerfully, you can use pill pickers to map those experience properties uh, directly over to anything that's happening within the flow. So not just the flow's explicit outputs, any of the actual outputs of the steps within the flow, you can map to these experience properties and really dynamically control what that user experience is. Um, not only that, but this is all updating in real time. So as the flow is progressing, as the flow is outputting different data at different steps along the way, the UI can reflect that and show different information. Um, this can be really powerful if you couple it with things like decision tables that can determine what fields to ask for, or what forms, rather. Um, and 
Also, all of our associated records have record watchers on them. So this doesn't depend on process automation designer. If, if uh, activity is associated to some random incident and an agent in the field updates that incident on their mobile phone totally outside of process automation designer, that will update in the playbook in real time as well. Everything that you're going to see in this demo is highly configurable. Um, this is a platform after all. We want your admins to be able to customize this as it suits your business use case. Um, there is a filter where you can filter activities in real time. You can control what fields are in that filter. Um, if a form is too big to fit in the card, we actually show it in the modal. You can control when that happens. Uh, by default, if you want to show an SLA in a SLA timer, countdown timer in a card, we're going to show the SLA that's going to finish first, but you can override that and specify a different role. You can control the roles required to view certain activities so that two different users, a manager and a customer, can be interacting with the exact same playbook and see completely different activities based off of their role. Um, you can control which activities are expanded. By default, I mentioned that we expand activities that are in progress, but you might want to create an override rule and say, you know what, I only want to expand activities that are in progress, but are also assigned to me, so that it will really highlight the work that needs to get done to a specific agent. I mentioned custom renders, um, activity actions, and the location within Workspace. So now for the fun stuff, we're going to jump into the actual demo to see this um, in real time. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so here we have Process Automation Designer from last session. And these are the lanes and activities this slide I recommend. If you find anything interesting today and you want to play with it yourself, uh, um, you can go check this out. Um, here we have... An analysis lane, a remediation lane, we're not going to dive too deep into this because we did last time. Um, but what we're going to see uh, in the analysis lane, there's an introduction, um, a wait for condition where it's going to wait for issue type uh, to be provided. Um, as soon as the issue type is passed in, this step is complete. Whether it's done the playbook, whether it's done somewhere else, doesn't matter. Then it's going to create a child task that's associated with that issue type. Uh, it's going to use these pill pickers to insert references to the number, uh, create links to the actual issue, assign it to a user. It's going to let the agent send a Slack message. Last time we showed how to build a custom activity definition to collect info from the user and send a Slack message. And finally, it's going to wait for that task that was created in the last step to be complete. Using the pill pickers again, you can see it's using the record from the last step and it has a wait for a condition to be closed complete. So let's see how this actually appears to a user. So I'm going to jump into the custom workspace that comes with this lab, the Improve Work Lab. And I'm going to create a new issue. <clears throat> and just say, how about a new coffee maker? Now, because this issue now has a running playbook for it, uh, a playbook tab will show up. And we can jump over that and see the lanes that from this step are now rendered as an accordion. The first lane analysis is expanded. The introduction is expanded. And we see some helpful text. We have two declarative actions here, one to skip the step or one to mark it as complete. The fill issue type, this is, again, is a wait for condition. It's waiting for issue type to fill in. And it has an activity experience defined to embed these three fields. So even though issue type is the only field that is provided, um, we can uh, that's required, we can fill in these other fields as well. and do some work on the issue. Now, because the issue type has been filled in, that step automatically finishes. It goes to the next lane. You can see that it skipped over the first step, completed it automatically because that was an automated step. There was nothing for the user to do. It just created the task. However, we can see some information about what that task was created. We can see that it was assigned to ABLE, the record number, and so forth. Next, we can see the option to send the Slack message to the team. So if I say, Coffee maker sounds like a good idea. And hit send. That finishes. And if I jump over to Slack, we can see that we just got a nice message real time. Coffee maker sounds like a good idea to me. <clears throat> and then it has this last wait for condition where it's waiting for that child task to be complete. Um, so if I opened up that task in a new tab here, marked it as complete. 
and went back, we'd see now that that work has been done, this playbook has been completed as well. So before we expand on this and make this user experience a little better, let's see where those fields are coming from. <clears throat> so if I jump back over here and I um, take a look at any of these properties here, for example, let's take a look at the issue fill issue type activity and go to a configure activity. In addition to the required inputs that this takes, you can always switch over to the advanced view to look beneath the hood and see how this activities experience has been configured. Now you can see the experience type is record. You can see all the experience properties associated with the experience type of record. And you can see that a lot of them have been filled in. And many of these have been customized already for the specific type. So we can see the tagline uh, is fill issue type. If I pull up this little reference guide, we can see tagline goes up here. Uh, the icon has been set to be an asterisk. Uh, that's the icon here. Um, there's no title or description, but we can see that form fields have been filled in as a comma separate list of issue type priority location. That's why we show those three fields. I'm going to actually kick off another one so we can see this in real time. Um, this is kind of a dangerous idea. And we can see here are those three fields that were set up. Um, you can provide a comma separate list of form fields or a form view or both. Um, just know that the form fields you list have to be in that view for permissions purposes. And if you don't provide a view, it's going to look for them in the default view. That's why you see this here. Um, you can choose to uh, show attachments on the associated record or on the parent record. You can make those attachments read only. You can show an SLA timer if one exists, show a checklist if one exists, or mark a task as automated, which just renders it a little differently. Um, so all of those map one-to-one, -one, but you can also see that um, you can use these pill pickers to pull some of these values from the underlying flow if you prefer. So for example, uh, these issue type fields, uh, these form fields, they have to come from some record. So that's where you always see at the top of almost every experience property associated record. What is the record that's driving this experience? And we can see the pill picker here is that the record that's driving this experience is specifically the record that we're waiting on. Uh, we're waiting on some condition to be met. That's the record that we're going to show in this case. Now, we don't expect process owners to do this. We don't expect them to switch to the advanced view and fill all these fields in for their specific case. They can if they want to, if they want to customize it. But we expect the developers to fill these in ahead of time um, and to create very specific activity definitions that solve specific use cases. So rather than a process owner dragging and dropping in a wait for condition, um, they would drag in something specific. Now, let me give an example, and we'll actually walk through that. So let's go and go to the last step. We'll skip over this. Let's make this experience a little bit better. You know, we're waiting for a task to be completed, but we had to go and we had to uh, click in here to see the actual task to see we don't have any information about this. So let's create a custom activity definition to improve this experience, something that a process owner could just drop in. So we'll call it um, wait for IW task completion. <clears throat> this table here allows us to limit it to a specific parent record. You know, we don't want this wait for IW task completion to show up in any random process. It's not really relevant. So we're going to just say limit it to ones for IW issues. That was what the trigger was. If we went back here, we can see this process was kicked off anytime an IW issue was created. So we're only going to show it in those. And uh, now we choose an automation plan. This can be a flow or a flow action. In our case, it's just a flow action. So wait for condition. We'll hit save to see that flows inputs. We can see well, it's asking us for those conditions. So we're going to go ahead and pre-fill these. It's going to wait on a task. And it's going to wait for that task state to be one of this way the process owner doesn't have to 
build the condition builder. It will already pre-fill them for them. We're still going to leave record blank because the process owner does have to wire in which record they're waiting for. Next, we will switch over to the activity experience and we'll choose an experience type of record. And we'll save. And now we'll see all the experience properties for the record type. So for table, we know that we're waiting on a, a task. Associated record, we're going to use the pill picker here and map it to the input of this wait for condition and specifically the record that it's waiting on. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and put the records number into the tagline. So we'll pill pick over to that record again. And now we'll search for its number. Uh, icon, let's maybe throw in a document. Title, wait for IW task completion. And then description, we can put in some helpful information, say waiting for, and let's get the assigned to. Again, yeah, wait for condition. The, the font a little larger on that? Yeah, sure. Hopefully it won't uh, take away from the layout experience a little bit. Ah, Is that better. better? Thank you. Sure, sorry about that. So here we can pill pick into the record and find the assigned to. And we'll take that person's name. Waiting for so and so. Oh, I apps my mistake. I hit delete. Let's do that again. Oh, um, something strange is happening here. And then we'll throw in that record number one more time. Okay. And let's start with just that. Let's go ahead and save this new activity definition. And now in the designer, we're going to delete this generic wait for condition and add our custom one. Wait for IW task completion. And if we configure it, we can see again, the conditions in the table are already pre-filled for us. There's nothing that the process owner has to specify other than which record they're waiting on. So here we'll go to the activity list. We'll see that we're going to access the automated create record step. And we're going to go to its outputs and access the record that it generated there. That's what we're waiting for. We'll reactivate this. And we will now kick off a new Skip through this quickly. Now we have a much more useful card here. We can see the tagline, the icon, waiting for able to complete this, uh, and, and very useful. But we still have to get to this record somehow, right? We don't want them to have to go to the task. That word, that's where declarative actions come in. So let's go ahead and add a, a little header icon to this where we could click on something to open up that record and see what its state is. So we're going to go under Playbook, Activity Actions. We'll click New. And we'll call it view IW task. We'll give it a unique name. And now this can be a UI component such as a modal, a client action, or a service script. We're going to make it a client action. And we're going to choose preview record, which is the client action that opens up a record in a new tab and workspace. For table, this is specifically for IW tasks. <clears throat> And we're going to render this as uh, we could choose button, a header drop-down menu, or a header icon. We'll choose header icon. And for this, let's just choose an eye icon. Now for uh, our conditions, let's make sure that the user has read access to this record. 
Um, and I think that's really all we need to do here. So we'll save this. Because this doesn't change the way the process runs in any way, we don't have to kick it off again. We can just reload this record. So I'm just going to hit the back button, reopen it. I'll refresh. And sure enough, we have a little eye icon here, view IW task, where we can open that in a new record. Great. Now, the thing is, we still need Able here to go and mark this as complete, uh, do some extra work. What if Able is actually viewing this record? What if we could add a close button here? So let's do that one next. Click New. And call this close IW task. And this time we'll run a server script again on an IW task. And this will be rendered as a button. We can choose primary, secondary, tertiary. We'll leave it as primary. Now for these conditions, they actually need to have write access because they're going to be updating the record. And we only want this button to show up um, if the it's not already closed. So we're going to go and say is not one of closed. And then we're going to jump over to the server script field and set the state equal to three, which is for close complete, because this just extends the task table. And then we're going to update the record just like a UI action. And now, if we refresh, we can see there's now a close button. And if I clicked on this, it would actually close this record. But I'm not going to do that yet. I'm going to show how we only want the person who can close this is to be the one who's assigned to. We want to have different experiences for different users. Um, if we go back to conditions here, we can add another condition. And we'll say uh, assigned to is me. And now that button goes away because I am not able. But if I impersonate able, that button comes back. Uh, there it is. Now, what if we wanted to um, say, well, this is great, but I want able to actually be able to not just one click close, I'd like them to be able to provide some close notes, uh, maybe update to priority, do some other work. Um, now, in this case, uh, maybe there are some UI policies we want to observe, business rules. So rather than, and we want to have a custom layout. So rather than just provide a comma separate list of fields, I'm going to create an actual form view, a fully featured form view to embed here. I've already done this ahead of time. So we're going to jump over to the activity definition that we just created. And under the activity experience now, I'm going to jump to form view and use the one I created called playbook. Now, I can't just kick this process off again because the moment we click activate, we now lock down snapshots of all of these different activity definitions. So they're not going to reflect any changes we made to activity definitions. That's on purpose. Um, you never know what processes might be in the wild. If someone updates a definition, you don't want to break something that's already out there. So I could delete this and re-add it. But instead, I'm just going to go and show how a process owner could override something if they wanted to. I'll switch to the advanced view. I'll go to the activity experience. I can see here that form view has not been set because we're using a snapshot again. So I'll just add it here. And I'll reactivate it. Now, the next thing we have to do, though, before this will work is this uh, activity assignment, the close button, we now need to say that this requires form fields, form fields required, because now it's no longer just doing something on its own. It's actually submitting the form. Um, if there's no form to submit, no fields, this button isn't going to show up because it wouldn't make sense. Um, likewise, if there's no button on a form, we render the form as read-only. Um, the reason we do that is so that you can control when a form is actually control editable or not, when something can be submitted by adding a submit button. I'm highlighting this because this trips people up all the time. Um, we still get support requests saying, hey, my form is read-only. And you have to go in here and mark this form fields required. You're without a submit button 
button, the form will be read only. And I'll, I'll show the use case of why that's important. If I went here and kicked off another process, Here we see a read-only form. The priority, the expected start, the close date, this is that form field read-only. Uh, because there's no uh, close button. We're not the one who's assigned to it, so we don't want to show them a field like this. Um, but if I go and impersonate able, and refresh, able sees the actual rich form with the layouts, with the date pickers, the ability to change the priority and say, I'll do this next week and close the task, completing the job. And furthermore, if I go back and expand that, now I can see it's read only again. And uh, with the dates of what I submitted, because if you recall, if I end impersonation and go back to that definition for that button, we had a condition on there. Not only does it have to be assigned to able, but the state has to be not be closed, complete, incomplete, or skipped. Since the task is now done, uh, you can't go back and re-edit that form. We could, if we wanted to, we'd, uh, you know, make another button that says reopen or change and, and uh, require form fields, and also those form fields will be editable again. Again, we're making this as granular as possible so that you can really control this experience. Um, very, you know, basic sampling of some of the things you can do with these uh, pill pickers and with these fields and controlling the experience. There's a lot more here. Now, in terms of configuration, everything is wrapped up in what we call playbook experiences. All the configuration records, all the things that you can control are bundled up into this master config record. Um, that way, you can create custom playbook experiences for different scenarios. We have a custom um, improved work playbook. Uh, CSM provides their own complaint playbook. Um, HR has their own, all their groupings and configuration records. It is optional. If you don't specify one, by default, we will use the global playbook experience, which is a default. And it's also granular. You can, you can override specific parts of the global playbook experience. So if I look at the global playbook experience, I can see here that it defines a configuration record, um, which lets me specify uh, whether or not to show activity state and cards, what fields we want to filter on, whether to filter on the card status, which assigned to field we should use for those badges. Um, this guy, this badge here, if you want to use a different field instead of assigned to, the maximum form fields we show in a card before a form is shown in modal. Um, and SLA configuration, you can also override it for a specific playbook, not just for a specific playbook experience, one process definition. So if you don't create your own configuration, and you can see the improved work one, for example, actually in this case it does, but if you don't create a specific configuration, it's going to use the global one. In addition to our configuration record, you can see we have these activity overrides. This is where you can specify what you want to override and when. So for example, if I take a look at the, uh, say, knowledge article override, we can see that we have a when to apply tab and a what to override tab. If the type is ever knowledge, um, we want to override the renderer and render it with a knowledge card renderer instead. So you can filter based off of the type the input table, conditions on the input table, the associated table, conditions on the associated record, any of the activity property conditions tied to this type, you can build condition builders around them. And then what to override, you can choose to override the render, you can choose to override the expand state if you want to expand it, for example, if it is assigned to you, or you can require specific roles to view that activity. If the user doesn't have access isn't in those roles, that activity will be invisible to them. So that's it for the demo. We have a couple more slides to jump through here just to wrap up. So some key features we showed. This lets you visualize and interact with processes in real time. 
You can define user interactions with declarative actions. You control the user experience with activity overrides. You can integrate playbook experience into any workspace. You can extend the experience with custom activity renders. We support processes built with process automation designer, as well as HR lifecycle events. And we have a framework for sending others as different product lines decide to use playbook experience as their front end. And because this is on the now platform, it's extendable with everything the now platform can do from service level management, performance analytics, machine learning, et cetera. Anything the platform can do, you can embed directly. Um, nothing is dependent on, uh, on pad, for example. Uh, we are investing heavily in this product. There's a lot of features coming down the pipeline. Um, just in Quebec, there's the ability to cancel a playbook once it's been running, the ability to manually trigger playbooks. So you don't have to wait for conditions to be met. You can do it based off of a user action. Um, declarative actions for specific playbook experiences. So if you want to have uh, actions that don't have the potential to bleed into someone else's playbook experience from CSM to ITSM and so forth, you can do that. Um, in Quebec, uh, declarative actions for specific activity definitions. So if you want to just have a process owner drag and drop something on there and know that it's going to have a save button, you can have that. Uh, we'll be having declarative actions that not only can be activated on an activity, but can be activated on an entire stage or an entire playbook. We have a brand new, very modern UI that we're really proud of. Uh, activity state mapping, uh, the ability to control what the status of a card is, and the ability to add playbook to any page with UI Builder, not just workspace. All of that is coming in Quebec. Lots of ideas for Rome and beyond that, still very much in the planning stages, um, stage conditions, ad hoc activities, nested playbooks, grouped activities, custom playbook layouts, playbooks for creating new records, um, building custom activity renders and UI builder and a modern admin experience. So you don't have to rely on all the forms and fields we just showed. Um, so it's a great time to get involved. It's a great time to start playing with this, building your own playbooks uh, because the future is really bright. And that is it for me. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. A lot of good demo. There were some questions in here about, uh, you know, this is a part two. It was, it was, Clearly stated that by what we should have done is put a link to part one somewhere on the registration page or whatever. Uh, we will take that into account if we ever do a two-parter again in the future. So thank you very much. We do have a question that just came in as I was talking. Will playbooks have an equivalent to Flow Designer's code snippets to be able to use slash trigger playbooks from business rules or other elements of code? I think we need some differentiation between the playbooks and the uh, uh, you know, process automation designer and the playbook experience. So do you have any thoughts on that, Yaron? Sure. If I understand the, correct, the question correctly, in, in Quebec, we do provide, um, uh, we are providing a, um, a scriptable method where you can fire off any playbook manually. Um, you just give the, the scope name of the playbook, a parent record you want to fire it on, and it will execute that. And you can do that based off of a declarative action or a UI action. So you can present the agent with a button to launch a playbook on some child record, for example. We have another question that just came in. Where can I practice for both pad, process automation designer, and playbook experience? If I'm not mistaken, you can do that on the personal developer instance if you've got a Paris instance over at developer.servicenow.com. So head over there, mm -hmm. get that. I, I think it's turned on by default in Paris, but you may have to activate a plugin. I've got to check on that. There was uh, something about... Yeah, yeah, I believe you have to activate something. Yeah, the, the, not only the Process Automation Designer plugin, but look for the one, what was it, the uh, special one around custom apps or the custom tables. Uh, there was something in there that... If you if you go to the uh, the lab, the CreatorCon lab, it lists all the plugins that you should activate. Nice um, segue. To get Playbook working. We should bring that deck back up. Where is my... Sorry, I'm still getting familiar with I think it's actually the... right <laughs> here. <laughs> all right. I'm going to trust you on that one because, uh, yep, there it is, CCW 1001. I'm, I'm looking for my live view, and I've got to pop that out. I've got the Q&A in front of me. We've got a new control panel in front of us, people, so apologies for a little bit of the confusion and stumbling around. But, yes, this will be available online. You can do that. Walk through a step-by-step a -step process automation designer, uh, Lisa Holenstein, who I believe is on this video, and also the uh, person on the left-hand side of that picture put that all together. So you got a Paris instance, or you want to go do this, with one of our instances, you could do that as well. So look forward to walking through that situation. 
Are there any other questions, Craig or Jeremy, as I put flip around panels on here? Where can you find the lab? Um, you can, uh, good question. Thank you, Jennifer. Mm-hmm. You can go over to nowlearning.servicenow.com or you can go to, I believe it's servicenow.com slash creatorcon.html and log in and find the session there. So either the CreatorCon 2020 digital experience page from our main page or right to Now Learning and search for CCW 1001. I think you can also find it on developer.servicenow.com. Just do a search for CCW 1001. Should have the lab guide and that will give you instructions on how to get started on that. So lab guides in one place, simulator and the walkthrough materials on another. It all comes together in a wonderful experience. Uh, inactivity definition, instead of the fulfiller seeing the read-only form fields or the form field in the activity definition, uh, can a deep link be configured for a task we are waiting on or a related task item? Did you catch that, Yaron? Yeah, we kind of did that. We um, we added a uh, that eye icon as a declarative action that mm-hmm. would let you open up that record in a new tab. So it's not done automatically. Um, we definitely we're, we're we're taking the approach with this to really give the admins a lot of control and to not make a lot of assumptions for them. So if they want to add an icon because maybe you want that to be a button, maybe you want it to be a drop down, maybe you don't want it at all. Um, you can add that and you can also add that conditionally. So you can say, for example, add a button that says, if it's not assigned to you, um, in which case you can't close this, you can't see the form, uh, then we'll give you a view record link, for example. I am going to be a little pedantic on one element that I saw you do when you were putting together that action where you said uh, the state is one of, and you said close complete, close incomplete, and close skipped. All of those Mm -hmm. set the active field to false, so think about another alternative of saying active is false or active is true. It, it's, it's the inverse mm-hmm. because what I've seen in the past is people will say, oh, we need a new state. And it'll be a new open state or a new closed state being active equals true or active equals false. And you have, it's, it's no fun going by and looking for all of those actions that are choosing state or finding them later going, why isn't this working when we're in this one state? So think about the ways that active is impacted by state and you can often shortcut a lot of these uh, maintenance issues later on. Good idea. Choice list, got to love them. But I do like the is one of. That came along <laughs> years ago, and it, it wasn't part of the original platform that I grew up with. And when I discovered it, I went, oh, this is so nice. All right. <laughs> do we have any... Actually, I'm kind of surprised you use pandantic in a sentence. Uh... <laughs> P- pedantic? <laughs> yes. It means I'm, I'm going for the details. <laughs> I, know. I like to pass on the words here. I like to pass on the uh, the occasional tips of experience that we get in this show. You know, we've all got lots of lots of experience and nuggets of information that we can share. So when I see like, okay, that's a different way that I hadn't thought of. Let's share mm-hmm. those. Okay, thank you very much, Yaron. Let me just do the uh, closing up. We invite you to join yeah. us next month, where I promise the audio will be better when we start. I will fix this up in post and get it posted out to YouTube as well. But registration is already open for Tech Now number 82. If you go to bit.ly slash TN82 Reg, you can find it there. Craig is going to be our instance data replication or IDR subject matter expert. So he is yes. actively working on that right now to pull together all the information he can and show off how you can tie two ServiceNow instances together and exchange data very quickly. This is not building complex REST integrations and whatnot that you may have experienced in no. the past. So I remember it's those really days. a cool product, and uh, I see a lot of flexibility in it uh, for a lot of use cases. So looking forward to it. Give yourself a Christmas present. Join us December fifteenth, an early Christmas present. December fifteenth, eight a.m. Pacific time, or That's whatever right. that is in your time zone. We look forward to that. Go over and sign up for that uh, right now if you want. There's also a link in the resource panel for that as well. Other reference information, of course, all this is good stuff from the doc site. Go to the community if you've got questions. The developer portal, if you want to go get a free personal developer, and just play around with some of these things, see if you can build out a uh, process <clears throat> automation designer. Watch video number one. That's over at bit.ly slash TN80 blog. So I do have a system of madness to these bit.ly links that I distribute because i got to remember them. It's really hard to remember a community link with a sys ID in it. So I shorten them up for you and for me. Yeah, don't share sys IDs out. That'd be crazy. <laughs> Read those over the phone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we also A, two, have six, but... 
plenty of others over at this bit.ly link, bit.ly slash ServiceNow Tech. Now, that's the master. That's the home. That's the index of all the episodes we've done to date going back to early 2013. So you can see, you know, the different hosts and the different haircuts. And, you know, it, it's kind of fun as we go through this. But always that same theme music for whatever reason. <laughs> so if we didn't get to your Q&A today, many apologies. We are running a little... Uh, short up on the end of the hour, and we will answer those online and send you a notification with a link right to the community article with your answer to those questions. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, don't do we have any last minute? We'll do. We got a couple minutes. Let's uh, check. Do we have any last minute Q and A that needs uh, filtering through this through Yaron? Well, we've got him here. He asks Craig and Jeremy. I'm actually looking. Um... I don't see anything we haven't really spoken about already. Okay. All right, then. That I was asking if that. Pad, uh, if the C, uh, the CreatorCon 1001 will include Playbook. Yes. If you go and do that automated lab, it'll set up an instance with everything pre-configured for you. You just walk through the lab exercise. Oh. So pretty straightforward. And I see Jeremy already answered it. So, yes. Woohoo! Jeremy's on top of it. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you, Yarn, for sharing the uh, Playbook you know, the peanut butter and jelly. We had peanut butter last month. We got jelly this month. So I'm not going to sing the song, but you get the idea. <laughs> we'll, we'll move on and uh, hope you can join us next month, dear viewer, for December 15th when Craig talks about IDR. Until then, take care, be safe, and talk to you soon. 